issues for me around the giving and getting of feedback emerged quite early in my life. First, as I was training to become a dancer, and then later in my work as both a teacher and a choreographer. I had come to believe that we really could make our work better if we interacted with other people. It's just that I wanted some rules around that. In formulating the process, I gave a lot of thought to these questions. Why was it that I could actually hear good and bad, negative and positive, all kinds of things from some people, whereas other people I couldn't hear a thing? Was it something about the person or our relationship? And I wondered what conditions did I need to set so that I myself could hear the feedback in a better way? I'm Liz Lerman, and I made this process in 1990. This is John Borstel, and he shepherded the process and helped to improve it almost from the beginning and co-wrote the book with me. The critical response process is a four-step process for giving and getting feedback on artistic work in progress. It differs from other feedback methods that you might have experienced in that it gives the artist an active role in the discussion of their own work. And in doing so, it surfaces some key values. One is dialogue. The discovery is made simply through the process of people talking to each other. It harnesses the idea of inquiry, that asking questions is important, and that we might discover something new just by the act of articulating a question for ourselves or by being challenged by another person to answer a question. And there's a real premium price placed on discovery, that the discussion of a work in progress is not simply an exercise in evaluation or reviewing its merit, it's a process of learning, both for the artist who might find a new direction for the work and for the responders who might learn something about their own perceptions and their own relationship to artistic work. The critical response process starts after the viewing of the work in progress. It usually starts with a question. What was exciting, meaningful, memorable, interesting, stimulating, evocative about the work in question. And those responding will have a chance to answer that starting question. This question opens up many different ways of looking at the work. So in this first step it's interesting because sometimes people think, oh, I'm complimenting the artist. And I just say, uh, it's not a compliment because when we give compliments we tend to be dismissive. What we're really talking about here is what was meaningful about our own experience of this art. It is true that we're filtering out our discomforts. It's not that we're not going to pay attention to them. In fact, we're going to pay a lot of attention to them in the following steps. But in this first step, the job of the responders is simply to really communicate what their experience was through as many ways as they can. And one of the things we often say is that nothing is too small to notice. Because in the statement of these step ones, we often see that different aspects of the work are illuminated, and details can be very useful for an artist to hear. Sometimes it's challenging to hear even positive things about your work, and an artist needs to be persuaded just to let the step one statements sink in. After step one, we move on to step two. Step two is the artist's opportunity to pose questions to the responders. In answering the questions, responders can give any kind of answer they want to give as long as it stays on topic with the question that's been posed. So for instance, if we had an artist showing a series of works that were all on canvases that weren't rectangles, but triangles, and the artist asked, what did you think of the triangular canvases? You could respond by saying, I liked the new shape of the canvas. It was a new way to look at work. Or you could say, I thought the device was a little trite. What you couldn't say is, the canvas shapes were all right, but I didn't like the muddy colors you're using in your palette. An underlying premise of the critical response process is that people learn best when they aren't defensive. So we want to keep people's defenses down. When a person says, what do you think of my triangular paintings? They're saying, I am ready to hear that. Tell me everything you think about that. But they aren't giving you permission to talk about just anything. We have to hold off for that. 
The other thing you can notice in this second step is the artists will start to let you know what is of concern to them by the very questions they're asking. And we want to pay attention to that because we may want to push them on that as the process proceeds. In step three of the process, the dialogue is reversed. And now responders have the opportunity to pose questions to the artist. We ask that those questions be posed neutrally. A question can simply be motivated by curiosity, but if it's motivated by an opinion, the discipline of step three is to phrase the question in a way that the opinion is not revealed in asking the question. It's hard to ask a neutral question, but it's worthy. For one thing, the artists are going to get into a really good conversation when you do it. But also for the responder, there are a few things that happen. One is you get to understand truly what your opinion is. And secondly, you can even begin to wonder, why is this coming up at this point? And it gives you a chance to reflect back over your own choices about art. So how do you ask a neutral question? Let's go back to that example of the artist with the canvas and the responder who thinks that the colors are muddy. That responder could simply ask, why are your colors so muddy? But that wouldn't be a neutral question. So the responder has to find another way to get at the question that's really burning for them. A way to neutralize might be something like, talk about your choice of colors, or what governed your choice of colors for these canvases? So you can see that if you said, why are your colors so muddy, an artist might go, Ugh. I can't believe you're asking me that and get all defensive and then of course the learning has stopped. What we're in, or they may just start explaining themselves and what we're interested in is not explanation but discovery. In step four of the process, responders have an opportunity to pose opinions to the artist. But there's a very specific format through which to do this. Responders need to start by saying, I have an opinion about X. I have an opinion about a particular subject that they name and articulate. The artist then has the opportunity to say yes or no. Now, artists usually say yes, especially if the person giving the opinion has participated in the whole process. It's like building up a relationship. So you've done all the steps by now. Of course the artist wants to hear what you have to say. And of course, after the artist says yes, then the responder has the opportunity to actually state the opinion. Now, some people find this the most uh, odd, arcane, ritualistic aspect of the process. It can be the hardest thing for some folks to grasp about it. But it's there for a variety of reasons. One of them is that an opinion coming at you can almost be like an object thrown in your direction. And how you position yourself to receive it can depend a great deal on knowing what's coming at you. It also disciplines the responder to constantly identify what they're saying as an opinion, not necessarily as a truth. It turns out often in step four, people cycle back to the beginning. So these opinions at the end, yes, often they are discomforts and they're built on some hard feelings or difficult uh, ways of looking at the work. But sometimes too, they come back to things that really move them. After all, it's all opinion. Critical response simply sequences it and gives us a way to move through them.